Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode nine. You can find us on YouTube, um, Twitter, Facebook, and you can also find all those links on theseedsofliberty.com. So today we have John Moss coming from Connecticut. He has a Facebook page, The New Sons and Daughters of Liberty, and he's also an admin on Raising Common Sense Anarchists, and he is a anarchist slash unschooling father of a seven-year-old, uh, practicing the radical method of unschooling, uh, churning out kids anti-state style. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> so, John, um, tell us a little bit. Why don't we start with how you became an anarchist, and then we'll dive into the unschooling philosophy. All right. Well, thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for your service. <laughs> yeah, right. Yes. I call I call every homeschooler. You know, that's thank you for your service. We're actually providing a legit service. We're actually cranking out anti-state kids. So, um, yeah, no, my path to anarchy is pretty similar to just about anybody's. There's really nothing special about it. It's your typical, you know, used to be a, a constitutionalist, used to be a neocon, and got sick of that, and thought I was a liberal for a while, and realized they're just as bad, and became a big L um, libertarian for a while, was still into voting and, and thought that mattered and got into Ron Paul, Gary Johnson and, and the, the natural progression of things uh, was that it just it didn't it didn't stop for me. It was like, well this a little bit of freedom sounds nice. Well what about more freedom? And ultimately that just leads you to the logical conclusion of a stateless society and here I am. You did you didn't vote for Obama, did you? No. <laughs> do I? Do Dave's, my... they, they's never gonna let me live it down. I, 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 I don't. I, I would have probably had to dip out. I'm we, can't, out we can't really forget it. You announced it during at least the first three episodes. <laughs> well, that, that was our moment of like, uh, you know, confessions. It's like the confessional here. <laughs> oh, just for our past <sighs> sins. <laughs> Political from... sins. When, when I say I thought I was a liberal, I was a liberal in the sense of like. Well, conservatives are stupid, so I must be a liberal, you know, like, <laughs> like that thing. But um, no, the um, the only time I ever voted in a presidential election was 2008 and 2012. And in 2008, I voted for Bob Barr. In 2012, I voted Gary Johnson. Uh, both guys were a libertarian party, so I didn't know what I was doing. But I was like, well, these two assholes suck, so I'll I'll vote the libertarian. <laughs> that was good. I uh, I voted for myself in the 2008 <laughs> election. <laughs> I wrote I wrote my name in as as president. Excellent. <laughs> I don't know if I've told you guys this. I couldn't vote for McCain. Oh yeah. Cuz yeah, he, looks... he was such a liberal flip-flopper. <laughs> you know, like Yeah, he looks old and creepy. So, no, so... no, his age had nothing to do with it. Ron Paul was not going to win it, so Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So so John, uh, what uh, what personalities influenced your your path to unschooling or or or, or uh, you know people or books or podcasts? Oh, this, uh, this is a good one. Um, I was I've always been a big fan of talk radio. Uh, so when I was uh, when I was uh, younger, I used to listen to. I, I started getting into it. Um, you guys ever heard of Michael Savage? Savage Nation. Yeah. You guys the, the Jew that hates Jews. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Right. The um. The guy's a fucking lunatic, but um, that's who I started listening to. <laughs> he is a lunatic, Jesus he, Almighty. He's a lunatic, but he was entertaining, so he got me to listen because I, I thought he was entertaining. Actually, what had happened was I was working for a radio station at the time. Nothing glamorous, just like some weekend uh, board work. And uh, while I was there, uh, one of the shows that came on that I, I syndicated was Michael Savage, so I had no choice but to sit and listen to him. And I'm, and I'm listening to him rag on Obama and call out all of his, uh, all the scandals and all that. And I'm like, this guy's got a point. And it just kind of sucked you into that whole borders language culture nonsense. So I was really big into that for a while, being a real neocon. <laughs> and um, a little after, a little after that, I discovered Alex Jones and got into that whole nightmare for a while and was listening to Infowars all the time. <laughs> Fear everything, boys! <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, listening to that long enough, you're ready to go fucking live in a bunker for the next 10 years. So yeah. um, while, while listening to Alex Jones and getting into the whole conspiracy theory thing, um, it, it actually did get me to see what bullshit the state is. Um, but I had fundamentally disagreed with with um, Adam, uh, not Adam, um, sorry, Alex Jones, because we're both sitting here going, oh my God, the government blew up 9-11, blah, 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 blah. 
He wants to restore the Republic. I say, well, if they're that fucking evil, let's just get rid of them entirely. I don't want to restore the Republic. <clears throat> so I, I disagreed on that and eventually discovered uh, Adam Kokesh and started listening to Adam versus the Man, which was an awesome show, and I dropped InfoWars entirely because InfoWars made me nothing but scared and angry, and uh, Adam Kokesh was funny. He was funny, he was upbeat, and he was more like, I love you, bro. Like, you know, he was just so lighthearted. <laughs> and he was talking about volunteerism and all of that stuff, so I really got into him and then discovered Chris Cantwell and discovered Mark and Rose and Stefan Molyneux and all these other guys, and here I am today. Yeah, I, I was I was mainly uh, influenced um, when my son was born. My 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 wife, uh, like a year later, she showed me um, a, a video by Stefan Molyneux on um, on spanking and corporal punishment, and uh, that's basically the, my first introduction to Stefan Molyneux. <laughs> so, and that's how I went down the path of volunteerism through that. And uh, yeah, he's an awesome he's an awesome force for peaceful parenting and uh, you know homeschooling. I, I really appreciate what he's doing his work. <laughs> I think I, I think I got it screwed up from before. I was, I was when you asked me my path. I was liberal first, then went to neocon, and then uh, just realized that. So correction, that's that's. What I, like. <laughs> mm -hmm. well, I, well, I think the the step from being a liberal to being a neocon is a bigger step than becoming a minarchist to a <laughs> voluntarist. Mm -hmm. No, because, not really. You know, uh, like well, yeah. They're, they're, maybe they're, they're I don't know. More, it depends on your family, really. They're a lot more similar than they like to believe. That's why they. That's why they stay at each other's throats all the time because they've convinced. They they've been convinced that they're the exact opposite, even though they're really fighting for the same. They, they're fighting for the same things. Um, yeah. They just ha they just give them different names and they say they point the finger and say now go after that guy and they all go okay. <laughs> yeah, it's like it's like walking up on two brothers fighting, and then like you hit one of the brothers and then they both look at you and like, you can't hit my brother. And they, they jump on you like, uh, they're arguing about same sex marriage. And you're like, I don't actually think the state should exist. And they're like, the what? <laughs> Get him. Yeah. It's, 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 I was going to say, it's funny. You mentioned the, the Michael Savage thing. Cause I've, I've seen that a lot actually that when you, when, who, when you go through that stage, there's usually one of those maniacs that you find and then that's the one that starts leading you. For me, it was Mark Levin. Uh, oh, yeah, I found, I, I found, yeah, he was, uh, he, I mean, he's a, he's a nut job. Um, he screams and calls everybody statist. And now I just look at him and go, do you, even, you don't know what that word means. Do you? Yeah. I had one of his <laughs> book. It was called, uh, freedom to fascism or something like that i can't that's remember the, that's can't, the movie no 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 he has a book called something about fascism from, from oh i should I, know i have every one of them on my bookshelf one of them signed i actually met him yeah um, and uh, right before i right before book, i gave up state of his all together the all whole together. book he's <laughs> talking about status status yeah. want this status want that and then like uh Anybody that ask him should anarchy be an uh, you know should should is anarchy even plausible? He's like no. That anybody that's an anarchist is an idiot. And like well, you do know that the opposite of anarchy is status. Mm -hmm. There's no there's <laughs> this is not a gray. There's there's no black and white. Like you can't be a minarchist and hate statist. You are a statist. You're a you're a self loathing statist. <laughs> statist. <laughs> I remember when libertarian was the big buzzword and everybody like. Everyone was like, you're a libertarian? Oh, so you support Ted Cruz and Rand Paul? Like, no, no, fucking support Ted Cruz. <laughs> no, he's a neocon war hawk. <laughs> well, that's, that's part of how the language gets co-opted and how the state you know, perpet helps perpetuate itself by convincing people that the, the language changes. And uh, that's why, you know, the... That's why there's now the distinction between classical liberal and today's liberal, because they've just they hijack words and it happens on all sides of the status paradigm. And status is just the latest one because they're going to, you know, the, the ones that have the most invested in convincing their, um, you know, base that they're the ones that want real freedom. They'll cling to these words as quickly as they can and, and try to make it seem like they're maybe, the ones fighting for maybe freedom. Maybe Mark like Levin is a voluntarist but just can't admit it no and not then, by a long shot he has he deifies the founding father no no but if he came much. out on one episode and was like hey guys everything i've been saying for the last 10 years is complete bullshit anarchy is the way to go and uh yeah by the way uh if you're a neocon you're an idiot 
Like yeah. he's gonna he's gonna go bankrupt. Well, he's gonna he, lose his job. And, actually, know. actually, he may get to that point, but it'll be in steps because he actually, if you follow his career, there's a pattern he goes through, and people will bring certain things to his attention, and he'll laugh them off as being crazy and not knowing what they're talking about, and then a couple of years later he'll finally adopt what they were saying and act like he came to this real nation well, all on his own. He is a very intelligent and well-spoken oh, man. Oh, he, he's very intelligent. He's very intelligent. But he did the so, last time he did this was with um, his last book, I think, was the, the Liberty Amendments. And he came out with all these ideas about the Constitutional Convention and all this stuff. But a couple of years before that, he spent like months railing against and, and name calling against um, Tom Woods and uh, Kevin Gutzman and Mike Church, who had all been talking about a constitutional, about a, you know, doing a constant, not a constitutional convention, but a, an Article Five convention. Um, and he was calling them ridiculous and they didn't know anything about the constitution. And well, they that was just... mainly based off fear because the fear is that the liberals are gonna get too much to say if we have a constitutional convention. What, no, yeah, exactly, a full scale one, but no, like he, just the just the Article Five convention. He made it seem like this was completely out of out of uh, out of left field, and there was no way this could be done, and it would never solve anything. And a couple of short years later, he waited till he wrote his own book on the matter, and put it out, and made a you know made a pretty penny. <laughs> yeah. So and John, now he's claiming that the one most wonderful thing in the world. So. So so John, like, uh, has your daughter been um, uh, homeschooled the whole time, or did you? No, actually. Um... We've only been homeschooling since uh, October of, of past year, 2014. Uh, she did go to public school for kindergarten, which was an absolute nightmare and a total mistake. Uh, so anybody listening, if you have young kids who are not yet in kindergarten, I would not send them. I wouldn't even start sending them. Um, it's, it's prison. It's prison for kids. Uh, the, uh, the socialization aspect, which, which these anti-homeschoolers are so crazy over, they get in trouble for talking. They, their, their social contact is limited to a 20 to 30 minute block of over supervised, over maintained, and, and overwatched uh, play time. On a, on a, you know, it's, it's monitored, it's watched, there, there's aids everywhere. And it's, <laughs> it's not socialization because the, the normal social behavior of a, of a child is discouraged. Did you say aids? Teacher's aides, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, too. I was like, I was like damn! I'm not, I'm not going anywhere near a school. <laughs> don't go, don't oh, send your kid another, to public school. They all have aides. <laughs> Seeds Teacher. Liberty reports that all... No, no. Maybe it should have been teachers. I don't know. There's teachers everywhere. Aides and... everywhere. <laughs> John Alex Jones Moss. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the syringes are all over the playground. Bye, <laughs> <laughs> oh me shit <laughs> oh. Wow, so, I did, so, I, he said AIDS and I was like what the fuck is he what so, so she, you said she just went to kindergarten then right she, yeah she went to kindergarten um, she was uh, she was miles ahead of her peers in reading but the rest of the school didn't seem to care the teachers didn't care they didn't really care about bumping her up because we, oh, we don't really do that we don't really skip a grade we can't really do that so her, the end result was that she was bringing home these books. They're called decodables, and decodables have—they're uh, literally watch Sally run. Sally ran fast, and she she's getting bored with them. She doesn't even want to read them. She has no interest in them. It's destroying <laughs> her love of, of learning, her love of reading. Yeah. yeah, public schools are just no good, man. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely would agree with that. Um, I uh, I actually recently um, got into a conversation. You, you know what I, I love to do when I'm on the, you know, like um, out the park, the playground, or a library, or you know, grocery store, wherever. If I meet somebody that's actually in school, like high school, middle school, I like to ask them. I like to ask them a few questions. First of all, do you enjoy going to school? <laughs> and a lot, a lot of them give me this like like jaded look, like. Like they're, you know, they're forced to say, yeah, I like it, <laughs> you know, but, but some of them say no. And I'm like, why? Oh, because, uh, you know, because I like to do this, but I can't do it. And then, and then, and then the other thing I asked them is what's your favorite subjects? And, 
And, you know, a lot of them say, you know, math or, or sorry, 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 like biology or history. And like just yesterday, and it, it just have fun, an interesting story. I talked to a, a girl. She's like 13 years old. She's in eighth grade. And she was saying her favorite, uh, her favorite uh, class is history. And so I said, really? So what about history exactly? Do you like, oh, I like learning about the wars. Oh, really? So what are you learning about now? <clears throat> she said she's learning about World War II. And I'm like, oh, so, so like you mean like, like World War II brought us out of the Depression and things like that? She's like, yeah, exactly. Isn't that, isn't that awesome? <laughs> oh, <laughs> so yeah. I, yeah, no, so I just, I just started, you know, gently going into, you know, introducing her to, you know, isn't that strange? Don't you think that's a little bit strange that, that, you know, a country that's bent on death and destruction, how does that bring prosperity? You know, how can that be good? If, de if death and destruction is good, then why don't, should we just destroy our own houses and factories and, and buildings that that would bring more prosperity because we would be employing the construction workers? And, you know, it's, it's like the same, it's like the same, the same logic is like, so if, if undertakers, if their business is dealing with dead people, so, so if more dead people, if more people died, then undertakers would be thriving, you know, <laughs> in their business. So does that mean we more people should die? <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, it's right, such right. twisted logic. And then I, I, I was saying that and she was really thinking about it, like, you know, I never thought of it like that. <laughs> yeah. And that's the other thing, too, is these government schools. And let's, let's be honest and call them what they are. They're not public schools. They're government schools. They get yeah. government funding. The government tells them what curriculum to use. Yeah. So obviously, I mean, let's let's be real here. History was written by the winners, by the winners. We all know that. So, of course, everything that your child is going to learn is, is the U.S. government is good. Everything we did was for a good reason. Like, kids are actually going to school and coming out thinking that dropping an atomic fucking bomb on Japan and wiping out a quarter million people was a good thing. This mm -hmm. is what public schools are teaching these kids. They don't learn about economics. They don't learn about the Federal Reserve. They don't learn about how their government works. They don't learn about taxation. They don't learn how to write checks. How to, I mean, these kids come out of high school barely able to tie their shoes. <laughs> well, not to mention that the entire government or the entire public school system is completely socialized. Mm. It's a whole social. And, and when you take that into consideration, you cannot logically point to one actual successful socialist program in the world. Not one, ever. So... You're sending your kids to a program that will never work. It's doomed to fail. Uh, and, and we don't really need to go through the whole statistics, but for, for those listening who might want a quick rundown, I mean, the, the U.S. spends more per student, uh, uh, spends more per student per year than any other country in the world, yet we're constantly in, you know, 14th, 15th in math, science. Cracking the top 10. And we spend more per student than any other country in the world. That should tell you that there is something fundamentally wrong with the education system. And what's the uh, what's the solution? They always say, throw more money at it. Why not print more money and throw more money at it? Ed like, education been, reform. Education reform. Yeah, because yeah, that didn't <laughs> work the first hundred years of public education. Let's keep trying it. Yeah, not to mention, uh, you know, the the whole Baltimore thing is going on right now, or is kind of you know happening and uh, Baltimore the city Baltimore schools spend the most in the country per student spend eighteen thousand dollars per student per year and yet they have probably one of the highest dropout rates they have <laughs> yeah I mean and, and why are these kids dropping out because they're, they're it's prison they're they're not learning what they want to learn they're discouraged to learn in, in most cases uh, they're being told that they're stupid through through not passing these standardized testing. They're not teaching your kids how to think. They're teaching your kids what to think. Well, and, that go to school for eight hours or go sell heroin for eight hours. What's going to make you more money? Exactly, sell heroin, and I don't fucking blame <laughs> them one bit. <laughs> so, so, uh, so, John, can you explain your your style of of uh, homeschooling or unschooling that you do? Sure. Sure. Uh, yeah, we use a method called unschooling, uh, which was, I believe the term was coined by uh, John Holt back in the 70s. And what unschooling is, uh, if I can break it down into uh, as layman as possible, unschooling is just simply living your life as if the construct of school didn't exist. There is no formal um, 
structure. There is no, okay, it's 9 o'clock, time to wake up, time to have breakfast. 10 o'clock, time for your math lesson. 11 o'clock, time for your recess. What, like, there's just <laughs> simply, like, like, I put it this way. When, when she was going to public school, it was like this. You would wake up at 7 in the morning, or earlier, wake up at 6.30 in the morning, and then by 7 o'clock when the bus is coming around, it's, where's your shoes? I don't know. Where's your homework? You don't know where your homework is. Where's your lunch? Where's this? Uh, and it's 7 o'clock in the morning. I can't take mm -hmm. it that early. And the best part of unschooling is, or even homeschooling, is you set your own schedule. I mean, we wake up when we feel like it. We eat breakfast when we feel like it. We get dressed for the day when we feel like it. Uh, there's just there's no structure. There's no testing. There's no grades. There's nothing. The child just learns uh, through natural life. And so, uh, so unschooling is also called life-based learning. And that's exactly what it is. The, uh, when they're really young, like mine is seven, uh, the main focus is on play. Let them go out and play. Let them explore the world. They don't need to learn history right now. They don't need to learn, you know, all this, all this stuff in school. And for, as far as the basics, they teach themselves. Um, a great video that I can reference for anyone watching is a, a Larkin Rose video called The Need for Edumacation. Yeah, uh, I saw that. <laughs> it's a great video. video. 15 minutes is perfect length. Yeah. And it, it, the, the uh, synopsis of it, it basically is that when left alone, you teach yourself how to do things, and there's no better proof than when you were a baby, you taught yourself a language. And not only did you teach yourself a language, you taught it based on nothing. It's not like if, if someone wants to teach me Chinese, we can do that because I know English, they might know English, and, and you can say, okay, this means that and that means this, and you have something to work with. When you're a baby, you have nothing. There's, there's absolutely nothing going on, and you teach yourself how to speak a language. Um, there's been studies done that when you leave kids alone with books, they teach themselves to read. Uh, it, the human mind is absolutely amazing what it's capable of doing. And, and the way it's capable of learning things, you just leave your child alone and what they need to learn, they will learn. Uh, my daughter, she likes to set up a, a, a fake store all the time and she has prices and her little cash register. And I mean, that right there, she's learning economics and, and math making change. And she doesn't even realize it. She's just playing. And I'm, I'm there, I'm a, basically a stay-at-home dad. I change my hours. I work at a, a casino, so they're 24 hours a day. And uh, I change my shift. I work 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. now. So I'm basically home all day with her. And we just do things like that. And she's, she's learning math just through playing. Or I, I cook a lot, and I, I, I cook, I bake, and uh, she helps me out in the kitchen. She's learning fractions, you know, a quarter cup of this, a half a tablespoon of this. She's learning math. And just by living your life, you learn so much more than being sat in an institution with 30 other kids exactly your age being lectured at by an authority. You're not one of those asshole blackjack dealers that tells everyone to hit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should hit you should hit right there, man. I don't feel like I should hit. No, go ahead and hit. It's a smart thing to do. And oh, and then you bust. Ah, okay. Only if you're not tipping. If you're not tipping, then I'm like, sure go split tens. Yeah, that's a good move. <laughs> <laughs> Don't split tens, boys. Um, you, you know, you were saying about the basically the, the self learning aspect of of you know young kids like that, and I, I truly believe that that's the reason that public in, uh, institutions have been implemented uh, because the you know the ruling class has always existed in some form or another. We've we've lived under the some form of the state. Well, we, you know, the collective we, humanity has li has lived under some form of the state for for five thousand, you know, plus years, mm -hmm. and with the schooling system, especially the one that that we have to face here in the U.S., which is essentially, you know, the Prussian system that was brought over. The whole yep. design of that is to to be like, you know, you were saying how it was very regimented, even in, in kindergarten, which is just insane. Because I mean, I remember kindergarten, and it wasn't that bad back then. Um, I mean, it's obviously gotten worse. Um, but they, they don't want free thinkers. They, they want that, re you know, they want it regimented. They want everything on a schedule, um, because the whole idea behind the Prussian system was to create obedient citizens and, you know, passive, um, <clears throat> passive participants in life. Exactly. So they didn't strike out against the state. So that's, you know, it's, it's terrifying to people. And it's, it's so funny because the indoctrination all of us receive for the most part, 
um, while we were growing up kept us hidden from that just like it did with our parents and, and you know going back and back and back so you get so many people I, I can imagine you know I, myself I'm, I'm going to be homeschooling my uh, I have twin girls and they're only three and a half right now uh, oh, wow. but that was one that was one of the very few things my wife and I agreed with uh, from the very start because uh, she was a special education teacher before they were born and yeah. I knew I knew what my life was like after going to the public school system so we as soon as we yeah. started talking about children, we were like, yeah, we're going to homeschool. And we're like, all right, great. We've got that agreed upon. Um, <laughs> but now it's gotten, it's gotten even worse with like the common core, how they just keep pushing and pushing. But so many people defend this because that's all they know. That's how they were brought up. They look at themselves and say, I turned out fine, not realizing that they were stifled as, as children mm -hmm. and, and how, you know, or, or they just assume, oh, you need a teacher. You can't do it yourself. You can't let your kid learn. They, that's why people are paid to do that. Well, that's ridiculous. If you can't if you can't teach your kid how to do or, or or allow them to teach themselves to do basic life functions, then you've got a lot more problems than sending them to school. <laughs> <laughs> right. And yeah, you're absolutely right. They don't want free thinkers at all. I mean, they, they were modeled after the Prussian school systems, which, as, as you know, were indoctrination centers. And I mean, why do you think people get so out of control angry when they see like a flag burning video or something? Like, it's, it's a piece of cloth. Who cares? It's my property. I'll burn it if I want to. Why, why are you getting so mad? And the answer is because of 13 years of the most formative time of their minds, of their lives, <clears throat> like this. I pledge allegiance <laughs> to the flag yeah. of the United States of America. <clears throat> so when you have that for 13 years and it's beaten into you day in and day out, that's all you know. And look what happens. You come out of school saying, oh, you should hate the government, not the flag. They're the ones who, you know, they're the ones who are doing it. Like, you don't get it. You weren't, you weren't taught to freely think. You were taught to blindly obey. So what always bothers me is they, the government wants law-abiding citizens, right? Law-abiding taxpayers. But yet there's two things they don't teach in public education. Law and tax, like how to pay your taxes. Mm -hmm. Well, they need to fill up the prisons too, so they don't want you knowing about law. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, yeah. They want to keep you in the dark on that, so they can say, "Oh, you're breaking this uh, law that you know you you knew you knew nothing about." They don't want free thinkers. They just want that schools are trying to crank out uh, uh, worker bees and soldiers, and that's it. That's all they're trying to do. That's why you see all the uh, the military recruiters there in high schools all the time. I mean, they want them. They want them young. They want them impressionable. They want this is this is what they want. They want to crank out tax cows and soldiers. For sure. Uh, no, I was just gonna say real quick. My um, my in twelfth grade, one one thing that was interesting for me I, that I remember that that I that stayed with me was in my economics class. Um, which you know I assume taught basically Keynesian economics. But it, interestingly enough, he did he did teach uh three he did he did mention three things that I thought were very. Um, remarkable for for an economics class in high school. The first thing he said he he taught us about um, supply and demand, and the way he did it was he had a uh, he had a it was seventh period, right? So it was like at the end of the day, right before going home, and so he's like, did, did anyone not have lunch, right? So one one guy raised his hand, didn't have lunch, so he's like, all right, there's a box of donuts over there, go over there, eat as many donuts as you can. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then after he, after he, uh, you know, he talked a little bit. Then, he, then he's like, "All right, a scale of one to ten, how was the first donut?" And I was like, he's like, "It was awesome. It was nine, ten. <laughs> and so he went down, and and it just like, you know, decreased. And it's just a, an awesome, very um, easy way to to understand supply and demand. And the other thing he said was, um, Alan Greenspan is the most powerful man in the world. <laughs> Whoever I, tells Alan Greenspan what to do at that time was, yeah, sure. Yeah, but I didn't. I didn't fully appreciate that. He didn't really go into what the Federal Reserve was, and I, I didn't really fully appreciate that until many, many years later. Like until I found out what the Federal Reserve. But that's all basically he said. Alan Greenspan is the most powerful man in the world. Understand yeah. that. <laughs> the the general is not the most powerful man in the world. The 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 the, the, the military uh, mind is not the most powerful man in the world. The man who funds him is the most powerful man in the world. Yeah. The bank who props up the war is the most powerful because yeah. without that that fuel the engine of war can't run yeah yeah so, so so the way i look at um the teachers in in government schools is i don't necessarily think that they're like wicked like they're trying to you know stifle creativity i just think that they're in a system that's completely inflexible 
and uh, detrimental to the people in it. And they can't do anything about it. Their hands are tied, you know. And maybe the teachers really do want to teach their kids, you know, something valuable, but they just can't because they're in such a such an oppressive uh, institution, you know. And, yeah. And that, and so yeah, so these people like like I know I know a bunch of um, you know a couple of volunteers like Katie Chaos. She's she she's a teacher in the uh, in a public school and uh, and I mean she came to volunteerism while she's teaching, so it's not like she started there while you know when she was volunteers, but but she's trying to teach her kids like Bitcoin and various things like that. But of course she's gonna leave <laughs> very soon, <laughs> the moment that gets you know more uh, known <laughs> that she's doing that. <clears throat> well, but, unless uh, she's ten tenured. I mean, you can be, as long as you don't go in there and, like shoot up a, a classroom as a teacher. If you're tenured, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, good luck. That, I, that was going to be my next point: is that why public schools are so bad is because they have these teachers' unions that lock them into these destructive contracts. It is literally impossible to fire a bad teacher. I mean, you pretty much you pretty much have to try. Like, I mean, sexual assault on a student, or or blatant racism, or something like that. I mean, you'd have to do something really, really horrible. And even then, you get you know your reviews and your you know tenure and this that and the other thing. So it's it's impossible to get these horrible teachers out of the school. Yeah, what's the the, the teacher in New York who uh, just wasn't coming to work? <laughs> he called in too many times, and so they put him on leave and then threatened to fire him. So then he sued the school system, and now he gets paid one hundred and eighty thousand dollars a year. To sit at his house and twiddle his thumbs. Yeah, taxpayer <laughs> money. So I mean, you, you got to get your kids out out of these places. These are the kinds of people that are educating your kids. Uh, you just you're better off educating them what, at home. What's gonna happen though, when like so many people pull kids out of the school, and all like like let's say you have an area that has a school and and let's go pie in the sky. Eighty percent of the people don't want to. Or aren't sending their kids to school or homeschooling somehow? <clears throat> aren't the eighty percent going to be able to say we're not paying for the, the the public school here? Yeah, I don't really know exactly how that works. That, that's definitely something that should be looked into. I mean, uh, we're a dem we're a democratic well, nation, right? Well, well, I, I would I would suggest that if if that you know if that hypothetical number was reached in any area they absolutely could pull out because that's that's the only way that i see um the you know the tax structure being taken down without the entire system collapsing altogether would be you know mass non-compliance you know so many people mm -hmm. are afraid to pay their taxes whether it be income taxes or property taxes which your school taxes are tied to you know because it's insane you you buy what you think is a piece of property that you own and then you have to turn around and now pay rent to the government in form of a property tax which your school tax are, are, are attached to and even if you don't have children and even if you never use the school system you're required to pay for this monstrosity that is just as you know as you were saying it's very destructive and this is you know for me saying this I was brought up by two educators you know, I have a lot of teachers in my family, so I have like a lot of direct knowledge about this. And even they have said that it's just gotten progressively worse. And, yeah. you know, my mom, my mom was a teacher for 30 something years and she's finally retiring now. I mean, she still doesn't see the whole picture, but she's seen enough to say that it's just, it's a complete waste and why should, why should anybody have to pay for this? Why should any, they send, anybody send their kids here to suffer through this? Because as you said, as you guys were saying, you know, the horrible teachers you can't replace and mm -hmm. the good, the, the good ones, the ones that really have the best intentions, the ones that really want to help children have their hands tied. Yeah, they can't. You know, exactly. You know, Danilla, you were saying about Katie, like there's only so much she can do because mm -hmm. there, there's people watching her at all times. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, you were saying how, you know, with the tent, you know, you guys were joking with the tenure with her. Well, it would backfire on somebody like her because the unions have a vested interest in getting people like her out of the system as well, because right. she's a threat to them because it's the teachers union that keep everything going. And they're the ones, like you guys said, you know, get the contracts and this ridiculous amount of money and and people keep clamoring oh we need more money for education yeah well where's the money going now the majority of it goes to wood bureaucratic administrative bullshit and and every time they add another million dollars two million ten million dollars whatever it is to, to each program all they're doing is just lining the pockets of the bureaucrats um, well, and the teachers I'll, will be I'll, lucky I'll if they get a, a raise 
I'll give you guys a little story about how this this public schooling is a, a, bo a boondoggle. Uh, I used to be uh, one of like the super conservative people in my area. I used to go to like all these functions and, and talk. And I really started digging into the AEA. If you know what the AEA is, it's the Alabama Education Association. It's the largest union in Alabama, all right, other than Alabama Power. <clears throat> um, so the AEA has a bunch of state senators, not like uh, big boy senators, but state senators on their payrolls. There's a few pay, uh, uh, senators getting like $800,000 a year from these unions for a job. And you know what they do in this job? They do nothing. They show up once a, once a year and, you know, oh, hey, you know, everything looks good here. I, my job's done. And then they walk back home or they go, they go home. And so I'm sitting here telling this to my aunt who is a t or my aunt who is a teacher. And I'm sitting here saying your money is going to fund the Democrats because that's majority who the AEA funds is the Democrats, and she's she's a Republican, of course, and she's like, well, I have to be in the AEA. That you can't be a teacher without being in the union. So if that's just Alabama, I can't imagine what it's like in New York, what it's like in California, what it's like in in, in a lot of the more heavily Democrat-ran blue states. Right, which is which is why I'm so confused that Connecticut has such great homeschooling laws because we are probably one of the top five psychotically liberal states in the union. <laughs> so so it, it's really cool. All I had to do to homeschool was I had to write a letter to the superintendent saying, uh, you know, effective immediately, I'm withdrawing my daughter uh, from the Montville public school systems uh, in accordance with CT statute, blah, 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 blah. Signed myself and my wife signed it and we turned it in and that was that. That was that. She was out of school. She. Um, she doesn't have to take any kind of testing. She doesn't uh, need any kind of evaluation. Uh, as far, yeah, it's really weird. As far as the state is concerned, she's she's out of public school, and it's literally my problem, which I couldn't be happier about. <laughs> but <as far laughs> so let's say she wanted to go to in fifteen years, or uh, she's nine. You said she's, she'll be seven very soon. Okay, yeah. so she's seven. So in like ten years. Let's say she wants to start ramping up to go to a college, a state-ran college, unfortunately. But let's say she wants to go to a college. Let's say she wants to go to UConn. Sure. Uh, what, how would you attack that? Well, um, <clears throat> if uh, homeschool kids want to go to college, that's a, uh, you know, that could be a good thing. Colleges uh, seem to really like seeing homeschoolers on the application. And uh, if she wants to get in, she can still take the... Uh, I don't even know what they're called anymore. The SATs, the ACT, so ACTs is the ACTs now. Well, whatever it is, she can take those. She can take any kind of aptitude test necessary to get into a college. Um, yeah, she just she can she can take the same test. Because I, I I know you can like much like GED courses, you can also get uh, there's a ACT courses. I don't know in, in Alabama. I don't. I, I guess it's called the ACT. I don't know where it, what it's called in other states. But I know you can go take ACT courses at colleges. They cost a little money, but they'll teach you how to pass and score well on that ACT. Mm -hmm. Yep, and that's, that's all open. Those are all options to her. Um, she may not even want to go to college, which would be fine by me. I mean, not only for me not to pay a quarter million dollars for her to go, but because uh, um, I, I really think these, these student loans are absolutely the most destructive scam that's, that's been perpetuated on these kids in a very, very long time. But that could get into a whole other show. We could go two hours on that. But these the student loans are no good. Only to come out with a worthless degree and, and, and no job. So so, so mean, let's let's talk about fears first. Like uh, I'm sure Jeremy and, and Danilo, whether they will admit it or not, have fears about this, you know, like uh, about this whole about this, this whole thing. I mean, is there any kind of fear that you guys have that you want to maybe address that maybe John could probably, you know, like fire extinguisher, you know? Well, I, I don't actually have any fears per se. I mean, there's always, I mean, I'm a very hypercritical person when it comes to myself, uh, as you guys know. Um, but I'm, uh, you know, so there's a part of me, I'm sure, that, that thinks I, I won't be good enough. But I, I don't really dwell on that. Uh, for me, I, I actually wanted to say, you know, John, you were saying that you know you're very lucky in Connecticut with the way it is because that's a that really is amazing because here in New York it's it's a nightmare like 
oh, yeah. we can we can write that letter but then there are evaluations and there are tests that we have to keep up with right um, I, and because they because they, they want to keep tabs on you and they want to make yeah, sure that you're still teaching them something that they they approve of versus they, versus I, what I, you want to do yeah i believe you still have to write like a letter of intent saying what mm -hmm. stuff you're going to be teaching and and all that stuff so un unfortunately, for, for people in, in states that have those laws, I really don't have any kind of decent advice for that because I, I just don't know. We just don't do that in Connecticut. I would say look into your local laws. And um, however you need to skirt around or, or go about it to unschool, I would, I would take every measure. That's been a point of contention with uh, me and my wife. Like, you know, sh she wants it to be legit, you know, you know, letter of intent, and then you get the packet of regulations, and then, you know, evaluations, and then periodic testing. And I just don't care about that. I don't think, yeah, I don't really care what the state thinks of, of what we're teaching our kids. Um, and I think that's just another way of kind of bowing to the state. And, and if you're already, if you're already letting the state know that you're homeschooling and they have regulations and you're complying with those regulations, I, I think that those regulations will only increase with time, in sure. you know, in, in such a state as New York. And so you're, you know, just 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 writing that letter of intent and letting them know you're homeschooling is just, it's just, um, you know, it's accepting that authority that they have authority over your kids, even even still, even if you're homeschooling, you know, by by sending that, you know, by 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 complying with those regulations. So, like. Um, but going back to what you were talking about, colleges and universities, that I get asked that a lot. Like, like you know, your so your kid is not going to get a degree, you're not going to get a diploma. So what if they want to go to college? <laughs> and I think that assumes a few, a few errors. And one is that college and universities will actually exist when they are of that age, because I think the college and universities are truly dinosaur institutions that are on their way out right now. Um, they're they're remnants of the past, because you know, with the internet, you know, and lightning fast transmission of ideas, I just don't see the 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 relevancy of an institution that charges thousands of dollars, <laughs> you know, per class or per year, to teach them information that they could. <laughs> easily get from piratebay.com. <laughs> I mean, it just it just doesn't make sense. Or even online courses. It just it's just so outdated. Just like just like public schools are completely outdated and and just dinosaur institutions. They're on their way out. And so the question is not, you know, what will you do if your kid wants to go to college? I think the question is like, you know, um, will he even want to go to college? I don't think, I don't think homeschooling kids will even want to go to college because they'll see that it's a waste of time. Why would they want to sit in a place like that when they're going to learn outdated knowledge? <laughs> yeah, you should be sending them to how to successfully navigate and use the internet to acquire knowledge classes. That's the only thing you should be doing. Uh, me, me and my girlfriend kind of got into a big argument. Well, not big. We, we haven't really gotten into any big arguments, but we kind of got into an argument and I said, look, there's no reason why right now every kid shouldn't be mailed a and I, put your brakes on and just listen to what I'm saying. If we have to have public schooling and my tax dollars are going to this, there's no reason why every kid doesn't have a pre-programmed iPad sent to their house or, or whatever government-issued box that could teach them. All these things that their teachers are saying you'd save on building that school, paying that plumbers and etc etc just just you understand what i'm saying here that price of that ipad and hell even paying for the internet connection for it if you wanted to really socialize this up would be a hell of a lot cheaper than paying for all these school districts to exist all of these freaking um teachers to have insurance and stuff you know if they're if the teachers can't even teach they're basically handed a Manual. Hey, this is what you have to teach. If you go outside these lines, if you draw outside the lines, you're out of here. Yeah, you make a, you make a good point, and and I do understand that. But they're, the schools are not worried about efficiency because it's not their money; it's your money. It's and your exactly, money. exactly. Government is a boondoggle. It's, it's a tragedy of the commons, right there. They're, yeah, they're not <laughs> interested in um, they're not interested in efficiency. But yeah, that I mean that would be the smart thing to do. I guess I'm thinking too much like a capitalist. If, 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 yeah, well. It, which they don't teach in school. If if uh, the teachers' unions got out of the way, the federal government got out of the way, and let public schools at least, I mean, if it's going to be tax funded, at least be on a local level and keep the federal government out of it, sure, it would run a lot more efficiently. That said, I still am very much in favor of unschooling and homeschooling because 
even with that awesome iPad and the internet connection, your child is going to be pumped full of whatever information the government wants them to learn. So while, yes, that would be a, a more efficient way to do it, I, I absolutely agree with that. It, it still doesn't be uh, homeschooling. I'm, I guess it's me trying to figure out a, a problem that government creates, trying to fix it with government. No, which we all know can't work, but what I'm doing is appeasing anyone that's had this thought as well. Because I've had this thought with the USPS forever. You take the USPS, and then you mail everyone a device that just, whenever the USPS gets a piece of your mail, they throw it into a scanner, it shows up on your device. <laughs> no, no, but the, the, the <laughs> idea that the government should be efficient is not is not the problem, right? We, we have to step back. <laughs> you know, we oppose the government not because it's inefficient, but because it's immoral, right? And taxation oh, for sure, is for theft, sure. I'm playing right? devil's so, advocate here. So yeah, but but I'm just saying. So regardless if it's you know inefficient, like like you don't want the thief to be efficient, right? You don't want the rapist to be efficient, <laughs> right? <laughs> no, we no, want, you don't. We, we don't want thieves and rapists. We oppose immorality. It seems right? the only thing the government is actually efficient at is bombing and killing people much, that, that, right? in my opinion <laughs> at this point in time in history we, we can go back and, and, and talk like some crazy constitutionalist patriot that says oh yeah the government was really good at doing this back in the day but at this point in time in 2015 it seems to me the only thing the government does well barely is blow people up and build military bases well, I'd say they're actually very good at that, um, yeah. and and they're also a pretty darn good thief. Um, but you know what you were saying about the the school, Dave. Um, you know, I I would tend to to lean more with John on this because, you know, I, I mean, I know you're just playing devil's advocate, but as he said, the they they would still control what goes on, and and the the biggest problem with with public schooling, I think, outside of the the government intervention and all that, you know, even for the people that like I said, the teachers that actually want to be doing something good and, and the people that honestly believe that, you know, they, they're happy to pay their taxes towards the public schools because they want an educated populace around them. Like, you know, those people exist. And, and for them, I, I think the biggest problem is that, is getting them to understand that under pretty much no circumstance ever does one size fit all. And that's what it boils down to. No matter how you design public education, whether you go Dave's route, which again, I, I think for efficiency purposes, I agree with John perfectly, because I've actually had the same idea. I've had the same discussion with people. Um, so on, on that end, it, it, it would work perfectly. Um, but it's, it's still trying to get one size to fit all, and that will never work. And you know, as you guys, you know, you guys were saying before about you know, college, even if kids do want to go to college, it, not all kids should go to college. And that's kind of, that's another thing that's drummed into kids through it, through the school system is you got to go to college. You got to go to college. You got to go to college. You know, there's this, um, well, that's your, because your, that that's because our parents, that generation, the baby boomers, so to say, it was actually really smart for you to go to college. If you could afford it, if you could pass it, if you could actually get out and do it and get a college education. Now, where Tom, Dick, and Harry have a, co uh, a, a, a college education, it, it's pointless. Well, they're getting useless degrees, too. I mean, you have kids coming out of college like, all right, I got my degree in 15th century Korean literature. And it's like, what are you going to use that for? You're not going to use that for anything. So there's these worthless education. 15th century <laughs> Korean literature. <You're> right. <laughs> Wait, wait, is that, is that North Korea or South Korea? <laughs> North Korea, best Korea! <laughs> well, well, 15th century, it was still all one if it existed, right? So. True, true. No, there, yeah, was no, there was, there was no Korea in the 15th century. No I'm confused. Wait a minute. See, look at this. We've all, we've all been duped by public education. See that? That's a, that's a reflection <laughs> would, of our education. Would that be... I, don't, I, I can't... made that up. Whatever. No, no, it was, it was quick. It was funny. Oh. Um, no, it cracks me up. Uh, for sure, that cracks me up. People, they get frivolous degrees and, you know, like... Uh, I'm a poli sci major. Like, okay, what the fuck are you gonna do with that? Yeah, yeah. Or, or uh, I got a like government. <laughs> no, it just. I have a buddy who uh, is not a smart fellow, Ooh. but did a two-year. Uh, well, what I would consider smart, he's probably smart in some. Uh, smart is being intelligent is relevant. A lot of people don't understand that. Um, but uh, you know, he went to two years and got a. a, a 
two years into a uh, uh, apprenticeship, and, and now he's <laughs> making more than anybody that I know that has a college degree. So, yeah. like, what the fuck are you like, cat, cat, like C A T, the 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 the, uh, the uh, tractor company or whatever that makes all these huge. They are a government subsidized company by and large, but you can go get a two year training program for them, come out as a crane operator and be making a hundred thousand dollars a year. Or you can go to public school and they pay for all that. Or you can go to, you know, state ran college institutions, get out, be 40 grand in debt, not pay that off to your 40. No one's going to hire you because you're all overqualified. The jobs for your degree don't exist anymore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But people don't like, Oh, I don't want to be a crane operator. <laughs> Doesn't matter. You got mouths to feed, motherfucker. Oh. I, I, I mean, I, I would say I don't think it. You know, the, you know whether whether people want to go to college or not, because there are still some things right now in in this in the system that we find ourselves in that, you know, if if people really want to pursue those avenues, they don't have a choice, uh, but but to get the fancy degree because they won't get the job. You know, hopefully, I I I, I tend to to agree with Danilo. I, I think things are being phased out for the better um although they're going to go they're going to go down kicking and screaming um but I, I i i like to think at least you know within 20 30 years um they will start being you know more people will be using the online things um but even in now if kids want to you know one one of the books that i read when i first when my kids were first born and i you know we already decided that we were going to homeschool once they reached the age uh, i actually read uh ron paul's book that he came out with uh, the school revolution uh back in uh, 2013 and you know a lot of the stuff I had already known because I had been thinking about homeschooling for a while. Uh, but the one thing I came across that I thought was really interesting was that that I again you're not taught this and this is kind of withheld from you. And he actually explains it in the book that it's kind of withheld from you by from people in the state that in most states if you do homeschool and you do it, you know the kids learn enough. And even if you're in a state where you have to, you know, like like I am in New York, where you have to follow their evaluation schedule and all that, um, you can actually have the kids without pushing them, you know, ridiculously hard, learn enough to pass the state's, you know, required tests to have them, you know, pass out of of their senior year at 16. And then if they want to go on to college, they can take two additional years in a combination of homeschool type, mm -hmm. in a homeschool type setting where at 18, if they really want to go to an actual university, they will join their friends, but they will be starting as a junior. Right. So if they have a, you know, if they have a, a, a passion that, that requires a degree under the, under the current paradigm and they, you know, they want to go that route, you're saving your, you know, you save yourself two years worth of tuition Oh, and sure. they're two they're two years ahead of everybody else mm -hmm. you know and and again that, that the only thing that people come back with with that is then they start coming up with the ridiculous you know their fears you know like you know you touched on briefly earlier john about the socialization aspect um and all and all that stuff you know that's what most people fear which is just ridiculous i mean i've always been of the opinion that you know even if you take out of the equation that yeah the socialization in public schools itself is screwed up because that's where the bully cultures grow mm -hmm. um you know, even even if you take that out of the equation, for me, I always looked at it like, well, if we're supposed to believe that this is school for education purposes, what the hell does socialization have to do with that in the first place? You're supposed to be learning. Like, if if you want if you want it to be taken seriously, like that's the purpose of it. Like, why does socialization matter? You know, plenty most kids end up playing, you know, either in a little league or or you know, or soccer or or, or some sport, or you find you know uh, groups in your area. Like most kids, you know, I grew up like that. Most people I know grow up like that. You know, you find different things anywhere where you're socializing outside of the school all my, setting. Yeah, all of my socialization came after school, and we all the neighborhood boys would get together and play baseball. Exactly. So like it's like that's just school was thing. terrible. Everyone, no one there wanted to be there. Yeah. yeah the, well, that, uh, it was like, fuck, I can't wait to get out of school so I can go play baseball. <laughs> yeah, the, uh, the whole how will they socialize is literally the homeschool equivalent of who will build the roads. It's the, the most common, uh, common question I get asked when I talk about homeschooling. And, um, yeah, there's so many things you can do. I mean, you can, there's karate, there's baseball, there's basketball, there's gymnastics, there's Cub Scouts. There's, there, I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Not to mention how... how 
ridiculous it is for kids to be together with kids of the same age. Like right. that doesn't happen in nature. If there was no, if we all like, the, <laughs> think about it like that, you know, like back in the day, they put all the school kids in the same classroom. Mm -hmm. You'd have, you'd have 30 kids, all of them different ages. Now, all eight year olds in one class, all nine year olds in one class, all 10. That's unnatural. That's not how reality works. Exactly. Exactly. In homeschooling, you can, you can really set your own uh, terms with that. Uh, and the other thing with the uh, the non-socializing is that, I mean, people, we live in the age of the internet. It is now easier than ever to hop online and within a couple of keystrokes, connect to an entire community of homeschoolers in your area. Uh, recently, we went to a, a homeschool meet and greet at, uh, there's a, a drive-in movie theater uh, about an hour north of us in Rhode Island. <clears throat> it's this old style drive-in movie theater. Um, they're one of like two left in, you know, the area. Usually it's $25 to get a whole carload of people in. Uh, this night, they, you know, they have to test the projectors and get the popcorn thing going. So they, they opened it for free to this one specific homeschool group on Facebook because I guess the owner knew a member or something like that. I'm not sure. But um, so it was free for everybody. It was homeschoolers everywhere. And we opened, we got there, we opened up our car door and we told our daughter, we were like, go, go run, go socialize, go play. And she ended up, she made a friend like that. And they ended up sitting at, at their car and watched the whole movie together at their car. They had their blankets and glow sticks and everything. It was really adorable. But I mean, <laughs> nice the point man. is, it, it, it's so easy to hop on Facebook and make, make, play dates with people in your area. So the socialization thing is really such a non-issue. Danilo's it, the master of play dates. <laughs> yeah, I am a, I'm the uh, stay-at-home father. Um, I guess like similar to you, right? So you, your wife works, right? Right, John? And and you and you like she works during the day and you Well, and you, he you works as well. I mean, yeah, I mean you, you you she works during the day, right? And you you're with the kids right. during the day? Yeah. Yeah, so, I work I work 8 to 4. And um, yeah. it works for us because I come home, it's about 4.30 in the morning when I get home. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I can do what I need to for an hour or two. I can eat and unwind, watch TV or whatever. Uh, I can sleep. My wife goes to work and I can sleep until 11 or noon. My daughter is so self-sufficient. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. she's, she's taught herself how to do everything. She makes her own breakfast. She changes herself. She gets her own morning routine done. Nice. And by the time I come downstairs, she's quietly watching TV and she's like, hey, hi, Granny. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, the, we go about our day. The, the socialization is, is kind of funny because I think a lot of parents assume like, like, what do you think I'm doing? You think I'm like locking my kid in a room and throwing books at him and that's it? That's what I'm doing? <laughs> <clears throat> you know, like, no, I'm like, like you said, connecting with people through email, through Facebook, through social media. You know, I'm calling, constantly calling parents, like setting up play dates. Where do you want to meet this time? You want to go to a museum? You want to go to the park? Where do you want to go? You know, and and, and I'm constantly doing new things. And my my kids, uh, you know, they're they're always asking, are we, are we going to meet new kids today? And they get so, <laughs> they get so excited. I have a yeah, uh, my son's going to be, yeah, my son's going to be five in uh, next month in June. And my daughter's going to be three in uh, in August, mm -hmm. and and um, they're very assertive, right? Um, they have no problem. They're not shy at all. They go up to adults, you know, anybody, and they just say, "Hi, my name is Marcus." <laughs> my name is Serena. You know, not shy at all. And it, it's just, it's just amazing how it, it flies in the face of this ridiculous socialization um, myth, you know. Um, it does, and they're getting the wrong kind of socialization when they go to public school. You've got bullies, you've got drug dealers, yeah, exactly. You've got all these pregnant teenagers. You've got all the the, the riffraff of society, the riffraff of the teenage society, all condensed into one place at once. I mean, I, I mean, it's amazing they get any kind of positive socialization out of it. Mm -hmm. And even then, they they can't so even if they do make a decent friend, they can't socialize. They get in trouble for talking during class. And their, their recesses are what twenty to thirty minutes of of over monitored, over regimented, uh, you know, play time where it's, it's monitored. The teacher is watching everything you do, and it's just it's not real socialization. I mean, these kids need to be they need to be free. You got to set them free on a playground and just let them live life and let them learn. Yeah, I mean, my school that I went to was the number one by the by the state standards, the number one 
drug school, you know, <laughs> kids on drugs or whatever in the state of Alabama. And it was a middle class area with a ninety percent white student ratio. It's easier to get LSD in, in I don't know, do kids even stu- still do LSD anymore? I don't know. But I mean, they least, did when I was in high school. At least when I at least when I Yeah they did. It was it was easier to get a hit of acid than it was to get like alcohol or cigarettes or anything. Oh, I used to love that, you know? Like if you found somebody that could buy you beer, it was always somebody's older brother. Oh, yeah. But to find weed, it was like, hey, has anybody got weed? Yeah. <laughs> like five people be like, yeah, I got you. <laughs> like, so no, we... Dave, Dave, I just want to correct you. So now today is two classes of drugs. You got the you got the illegal drugs, and then you got the legal drugs. You got Ritalin, Prozac, and Adderall. Oh, yeah. Right? You, so either yeah, yeah. way, if they're you see exposed. A kid, right? Yeah, if you see a kid with an Altoid box, 100% <laughs> that kid – well, I, back when I was in school, 100% that kid's got prescription pills in that mother frig. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, that's that. That's actually what makes the the public schools even more dangerous, because you know the most of the older generations of parents and even some of the newer ones think that the quote unquote illegal ones are the problem. Well, no, it's the legal ones that are being pumped out through the schools. What's the statute you know, limitation on selling illegal drugs or prescription drugs here? Does anybody know? Yeah, I have no idea. Okay, well, never mind. I'm not going to incriminate myself. Never mind. Well, they have, you know, they they pump these. You know, first and second graders, they're pumping with Ritalin and stuff. You know, the whole ADHD craze. I was, I was on it for nine years. I quit taking it. I yeah, refused well, to take it. I would sell it all. Well, that that those come through the school psychologists, you know, because the public education system and the or you know the government education system and the teachers unions are hooked up with the pharmaceutical companies and you know they cross promote each other basically never thought about that and, never uh, thought about that wow and, and, and that's yeah you follow the money just like with anything else when it comes to the government you follow the money and you find out who's supplying who and mm-hmm. that's why yeah. certain things happen and I, that, that's the culture really, that is nowadays i really don't know how just from high school, I don't know how I'm not in prison. I really don't. I got lucky. Honestly, I had eight I had eight really good friends die from ninth to twelfth grade from drug overdoses or drug related incidents. Yeah. It, you know, you take that in consideration to where it was harder to find a case of beer than it was to find a, a you know a twenty sack of weed or a script of Xanax. Like do people not realize that? Like, okay, if you legalize it, it's harder for your youth to get. It's harder for your kids to get. And I know I'm not making a case for legalization here, and I'm not making a case for government control on something. I'm just saying that when you put roadblocks up like that, it's harder for kids to get into that shit. Mm-hmm. And, like, when you're homeschooling your daughter, she's not going to be – she may later in life when she's – mentally adept at being able to handle a situation like walking up to five people and them saying, Hey, do you want a Xanax? Every one of us are doing it. That's not going to happen at your house. That's not going to happen at a play date. That's not going to happen at soccer. That's not going to happen at whatever else, because you're going to be there to be able to protect her from that, that scenario. But when your mom and dad or the bus is coming to pick you up and they drop you off at school and no one's there to watch you because the teachers don't give a shit. No one gives a shit. Well, it's not so much protecting her, but we're we're able to um, teach her to make the right decisions. Like when you're in public school, they jam this dare shit down your throat that that mm-hmm. doesn't do anything, and all it is it's all fear mongering. I mean, you know, they tell us Mar- marijuana will kill you. I mean, mm-hmm. they tell you all this. Bullshit. Oh, the dare just got burned hard. Did you see yeah, that? And you find out that it's all you find out that none of it's true, and then you don't take any of it seriously where you can control that in homeschooling. Actually, if, if we can rewind a little bit, there's something that uh, Danny said a, a little while ago I really, really wanted to touch on, was that, okay, we've, we've spent this podcast uh, discussing <clears throat> how horrible these, these student prisons are, and you want to get your kids out, but uh, another common thing I hear is that I'm just too afraid. I'm afraid I'm, I'm too stupid to teach my kid. I'm, I'm unqualified to, to teach, and I can't do it, and blah, 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 blah. No, you're not too stupid. You're you're not uh, underqualified. You don't need a qualification to help guide your child on the path of learning that they want. And that's really a, a big cornerstone of, of unschooling is that they follow their interests. For example, if she wants, if my daughter wants to uh, own a bakery someday, we'll, we'll say for example, she wants to own a bakery and have her own business. 
she doesn't need to learn about the War of 1812 or you know Magna Carta, you know any of these these useless tidbits of trivia that she just doesn't need. She can focus on exactly where she wants to go. Whether you know if she wants to own a bakery, she can she'll learn how to bake, and she goes that route, and then she can learn business and economics and go that route, and and you know focus her education on those two things, and and probably churn out a pretty decent business. So that's that's really what you're doing. You're you're just there to guide. You're not there to say, okay, junior, two plus three is five. This is how you do this. And this. You're just there as a guide, and your child will take their own path. Kids are so curious, and they want to learn everything that when you oh, just yeah. leave them alone, they will take their own path. It's amazing. I mean, my my six year old was really into reading for a while, and uh, we actually finished uh, Huckleberry Finn together. I, I don't know too many six year olds who are reading Huckleberry <laughs> Finn. They're mm-hmm. busy with this see Sally run shit in their schools. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, I um. Yeah, you're right. You know, kids kids do have a natural desire to learn, and I, and I think you know, um, yeah, curiosity is the first education. You know, and and that's one of the uh, one of the first things that's beat out of them. You know, when when you when you go to a government school is is what you want to learn is not important. This is what you have yeah. to learn, not yeah. what you want to learn, right? And it's like whatever you're interested, even if you were you were starting to get interested in a particular topic in school, like the bell rings, stop thinking about it and go to your next class. Yeah, that's, that's it's a good like, point. I never thought of that. Yeah. It's like a, it's like a military, you know. And and um, whenever I talk to people, like a- anywhere I am, right, anywhere I go, I try to talk about homeschooling and unschooling. I talk very openly. Like I think some parents are, are more quiet about it you know they don't want to stir the water but but me you know if somebody asks me I, I say I'm homeschooling I'm the stay-at-home homeschooling father and and most of the time I get met with with um, interest you know people say oh wow so how are you doing that what are you doing you know so I, I, I get a chance to explain it and um, and then if I get them really interested then I get their I, I get their contact information and then I send them one of the first things I send them is uh, Josie Wales video um, a prison by any other name I don't know if you, video, yeah. yeah, that's one of my favorite videos to send people about um, about government school and, and what it's about. And it's basically a comparison of prison to government school, and it is like parallel <laughs> comparison. You know, no, no freedom of association, no freedom of speech. Um, mm-hmm. You know, everything is regimented. The bell, you know, the bell determines everything. You know, you you appeal to authority. You know, you can't solve problems with your peers. You know, um, it, it's just amazing how. <laughs> how it's so similar, you know, and then you know the formation of the bullies, um, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just everything and then, is right. And then when you go to college, they're like, yeah, all that shit they taught you in in, in high school, we don't do that shit like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you're gonna have to, we're gonna have to retrain you how to learn. That's why you have to go to college, and then they're like, you need to take English, math, science <laughs> as your yeah. core classes because they want to teach you how they teach. That's a great point about the uh, the bell signifying stop thinking about this, start thinking about this. Like, you, you know, the students in art class and they're really getting into it, and all of a sudden, ding, 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 stop thinking about art. It's math time. <laughs> now you have to totally change gears and go to this new class and get your your book out. And you're still thinking about your art project, but no, stop this and start thinking here. It's just it's so destructive to square, learn. It's square peg, round hole. Yeah. Well, yeah. I think that I think that's you know that whole aspect is one of the most destructive things because it causes kids that can't work like that, which most it's, that it's unnatural. It, it is, but some kids can can adapt to that. But the ones that can, it makes them feel stupid or it making you because know, they because either they they're not allowed to they're they're not given the time to ask the questions they want or or the or the topic changes or they move on to the next class and then they feel like they're behind because they you know they 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 lose interest in these other classes um and it makes them feel dumb and then the kids that come out with the you know the really high grades have this inflated sense of themselves because they they've been praised as being smart but yeah. all they've been all they've been taught to do is memorized garbage i I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys a a, a situation on this whole thing uh, just to <laughs> explain this Jeremy when I was a I, I hate homework because that's not how I learn I learned through doing and uh, when I was in high school I took AP classes because AP classes didn't need home they didn't give homework it was all tests and I, I took calculus one which was the highest uh, math class you could take at my school I took that my junior year for my math class for the year right because you had to take a math every year you had to take a history every year you had to take a science whatever every year my senior year, I took pre-cal, 
Now, I passed Cal 1 with like a 93, all right, my junior year. Senior year, I told the teacher who taught me in Cal 1, I'm not going to do any of your homework. I made a 98, 95 on every test she gave, and she still gave me a D in the class because I refused to do homework. Like, that's how stupid public schooling is. It's bad. Um, yeah, the other, the other thing, uh, another myth that I would like to address is the myth of, well, not really a myth, more of a question that I get is, um, yeah, just like you said, Danny, uh, people get curious. They go, oh, you homeschool, and they start asking questions. And one question that I get a lot is, well, what do you have to buy? What kind of materials do you need? How much money do you spend per, per school year on, on what you do? And I tell them, well, it costs me whatever you pay for an internet connection. <laughs> That's about it. I mean, wow. You know, which you likely already have anyway. You're likely already spending your $50 a month or 60 a month on your high-speed internet. Between YouTube and Google, I mean, there's nothing you can't search for and find and, and learn about. There's nothing you can't learn on the internet. Give your kid an internet connection, teach them what Google and YouTube are, and set them free. Yeah, oh, yeah, even if you want to go the more, the slightly more structured route of, you know, just plain homeschooling, oh, yeah. and you don't want to go the homeschooling, there's stuff like the Khan Academy, which is free online. Uh, you my know? daughter, yeah, we yeah. Use yeah, there's other there's other programs, um, you know, like Ron Paul's coming up with his own curriculum. There's other stuff out there like that that are, you know, well, I mean, his his for example is free for kindergarten through fifth grade, and then they start charging in sixth grade. But yeah. even programs like that are not as expensive as people think, because people think of they think of the cost of of education in terms of what they pay in, in school taxes, which, right. as we've discussed already, you know, most of that goes to bureaucracy and doesn't actually touch the kids themselves. You know, the teachers get a salary from it, but even sure. that's paltry compared to what the rest of the administration is getting. Right. Um, so people think in those terms, oh, school is so expensive. No, it's not. You know, I, I have I have I have friends that. You know, there there's a there's a movement here on, even on Long Island where there's people that trade. In, like one person will pay for it one year and then they'll trade it the next year to somebody else and then it just starts getting passed around to other people you know and, and you share stuff or or you can purchase if you know like i said if you want to follow a more structured system you know you can buy these curriculums used you can you know you can mix and match stuff so yeah i mean you you're taking it to the complete lowest level with just the internet connection but you're right that is all you need but it, it really, it really is fear, and, and that's driven into people. And for I really think that has to do with you know the whole the whole state is paradigm where it's you know you're you're taught to look to experts for to for answers to things. So that's that that's why teachers are you know well they're the experts they have the degrees. It's like no yeah some of them are great people some of them are very smart people but you don't need a degree to teach. You don't you, all you have to, all you have to do is 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 love your damn kids. And want to see them succeed. <laughs> monkey it, see, it, I mean, monkey do. It really is as simple as that. Like if if you don't, I mean, I, 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 some people may think I'm being a dick about this, but if you don't love your kid enough to be willing to put the effort in, then Stop you should really, re you, you, <laughs> you should really, re you should really <laughs> rethink your your parenting position because it's it's not that hard. And and with the fact that your your kids will most likely be willing to learn as long as it's you know, something they're interested in, like we've been talking about, you know, that's what I plan on doing. You know, I, I have my daughters, they're, they are, tw they're identical twins, but they're already, they already have their own personalities and they're already showing interests in, in certain things. And, and that's it. You, you find what interests them. Are you going to dress them up like the shining? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, go, go, going, going back to the LSD conversation, I have a horrible story that maybe we'll get into another episode about be, tripping on LSD. I have and, a few and, horrible and, stories uh, as well. well. No, but, but, but directly related to The Shining while being at Fordham University. Oh, God. So, but we'll get into that in another episode. Things um, not to watch while tripping. Shining is on that list. I, I wasn't watching it. I was living it. Uh, that's all I'll say for now. Um, but, you know, it's it, it really is. It, it's, you know, you you... If, if your kids, when you allow them to, they, they have passions, they have things that they want to learn, you know, like b both, you know, Danilo and John, both you said, you know, your, your, your kids get interested, they get excited about things, you know, and I, I see that in my kids who are, you know, are a little bit younger, but you, you see that you just, you watch them and, and, and they want to learn because they don't know anything. How else do you learn? But you ask questions, you know, I know a lot of people that get agitated with kids at the, you know, the three-year-old stage when it's why, 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 why? 
But oh, I, I love they're that. Trying, they're trying. I love that. It, 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 yeah, because they're trying to learn. They they want to know. Like my kids, I love it. They want. They love to help me cook. You know, because I I do the cooking at the house. So they love watching me cook. And just like John said, you know, you t- I, I was teaching them measurements today, as I was because I make I I make homemade almond milk for them. And I was teaching them. You know, we were using the measuring cup. And I was. Te- you know, it's like all these little things people don't think of. And 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 it's that fear because it's been beaten into your head that. You know, the teachers are there for a reason. You can't possibly, you can't possibly have that knowledge. Well, if you really think that you're that inept, it's even more important that you teach your kids these things because you can relearn it with them. You know, that, that, you know, Dave, you said, asked earlier about the fears. Like originally that was one of my things. Well, like, what if I get to a point where I don't know something anymore? But then when I thought about it, it's like, well, then I can learn with them. You know, I can right? relearn this stuff, and it's you're like you're an adult. You're an adult. You can't learn anymore. Come on. Well, because people, you know, that goes back to something Dave said in a lot of other episodes about people being afraid to say I don't know. Yeah, you have to get over that because you think you were taught these things, and and whether you understand that it was, you know, indoctrinated garbage that was beaten into your head, um, or not, it's still like you forget that stuff. So like, it's it's okay to say I don't know. I don't <laughs> it's know okay means to say, it, it's it. I don't know does not equal white flag waving okay because when you're making that assertion it's almost like when your boss comes in i don't know if you guys work in in in, you know it it would almost be like your pit boss coming in and saying why haven't you done this i will get back with you on this that's the better answer than saying i don't know but there's some things that we don't know that we have to say i don't know and I will get back with you on this once I figure it out. There's a reason why I know everything about Scientology. There's a reason why I know all this shit about bullshit. It's because when something piques my interest, I have to know everything about it. And that's why I became a voluntarist. Mm-hmm. I was like, what's voluntary? What's anarchy? What's this? I had to know everything about it. I had to read everything about it. I think John mentioned earlier about uh, learning and you know the curiosity for learning. And I, I wrote a small article um, a few a uh, few months ago called um, "Learning and Living Are Inseparable." Right? There is no such thing as living without learning. <laughs> Life is about learning. Life is education. Right? And this obsession that people have when they think that the the only time that a kid can learn something is between the ages of you know five and seventeen, <laughs> and if they don't learn anything, if they don't learn anything that year, they're doomed. That's it. <laughs> There's no hope <laughs> right. because when you're an adult, you don't learn at all, right? No, we don't learn, <laughs> and and it's just a, it's just a very sad thing. Like it's it's like almost like we're scared or people are scared to just let their kids, you know, do what what feels natural to them to just have fun. Like having fun. Is is almost like a threat. So I, maybe I, I feel like some parents feel like it's it, it, they feel threatened when you just say no. I just let my kid play. You know, I do free play, free unstructured play, and they learn they learn through play. What? Well, how are they going to learn how to read, how to write, how to do their, how to do math, how to do blah blah? You know, it's like it's like if they need to know, they're going to learn. Like like, do you honestly believe in the age of you know um, iPhones and iPads and iPods and I and and, uh, and you know laptops, computers, and the internet that they're not going to learn how to read or write when, <laughs> when you know when there's people are that's how people communicate. You know, are you seriously think that your kid is that stupid that <laughs> they're they're not going to pick that up because they will have to pick it up if they want to communicate with the rest of the world, for, right? For sure. Like if like John John, do you speak Romanian? <laughs> do you speak Romanian, John? Do not speak Romanian. Okay, if I picked you up right now, if I was God, I picked you up and dropped you in Romania or wherever the hell they speak Romanian, in six months' time you would be speaking Romanian because you either adapt or die. Romania doesn't exist. No, I'm just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> uh, J- Japan, Japanese, uh, Korean, it doesn't matter where the fuck. I'm actually it, doing that at, at work because there, there's such a heavy uh, Chinese clientele at the uh, casino that just from from dealing with them day in and day out every day, I'm, I'm starting to pick up some basic 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 some basic Mandarin. Uh, you know, it's nothing more than like "Hi, how are you, motherfucker?" You know, little things like that. But, <laughs> the important, important stuff. stuff. The important, yeah, the very important <laughs> stuff. But yeah, you know, when you just when you're around it so so much that. Um, yeah, you just tend to pick it up. One of the uh, questions that I would get when I describe what unschooling is, is that they say, okay, there's no structure at all. 
there's there's no structure. What if, well, God, what if your daughter wants to just sit around and play Minecraft all day? And I, <laughs> exactly. kind, of look at, and I kind of look at them and I say, I let her. And <laughs> you could see their heads just explode. Like, oh, what? Like, you let you let her play video games all day and watch TV all day? I say, yeah. Like, you just you leave them alone. Let them let them learn. If they get bored of TV, which they will, they'll move on to something else. Um, you see, unschooling was introduced to me uh, last year at Porkfest. Um, they had a, a homeschool meet and greet. Porkfest, for those who might not know, is the uh, annual Porcupine Liberty event up in uh, New Hampshire every year. Uh, I was talking to a couple of ladies who were unschooling their daughter, and I, just, I went to learn more about homeschooling, and they said unschooling. I had never heard that term before. So in talking with them, uh, <clears throat> that's what I asked. I said, well, what if your son wants to play video games all day? And she says, well, I let him. And <laughs> I thought these ladies were absolutely out of their mind that shit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, letting your kids play video games all day, like what, what could that possibly accomplish? Um, Can you be my dad? Because <laughs> <laughs> that shit was taken away from me. <laughs> yeah, the, the console, oh, yeah. the, the Super Nintendo was hidden. <laughs> if, um, oh, yeah. I mean, if you let them, if the passion is there, uh, one of them told me a story about uh, you know, somebody she knew. Uh, her son was just video games, video games, video games. He was so into it, and that's all he did every day. And he eventually learned computer programming, and he eventually learned how video games are made. And now he works for, I mean, I, I haven't played video games in like 10, 15 years, so I don't really know who's who anymore, but... He now works for some really huge game company. I, maybe it's EA or Activision, or I don't really know any of the companies anymore, but he works for a really big <laughs> and, uh, You know, that's what he does. It's his passion was video games, and he, he followed it, and that's, that's where it led him. Uh, your kids want to learn. They, they will get bored of TV. They will get bored of, you know, doing monotonous, stupid things, video games, whatever. I and, mean, you know, they, they have their places and all that. But um, yeah, just leave them alone. Leave them alone and let them learn. Let them let them guide themselves. Be their guide, but don't be don't be their status ruler. Don't tell them what to do or how to do it. Let them, you know. Don't be afraid to let them make mistakes too. I I, uh, I actually that's a good point. You you bring up something that I I was talking to a guy. Uh, this family. Um, like I think it was like two months ago. My wife and I went to a wedding with uh, her coworkers. And and one of her coworkers, they have um, a seven-year-old daughter and a ten-year-old son, and I asked them. And they go to, they go to government school, of course. But I asked them, what does your? I, I said, what what is your daughter into? The seven-year-old, right? And they said, oh, they were so excited. It's like, oh, my daughter's into volleyball. She's into basketball. She does all these wonderful track and field. She's very athletic, and they're so happy and proud, right? And I'm like, all right. So what is your son into? And then they just got this really depressed look. Oh. He, all, all he wants to do is just play video games, <laughs> and they're just so disappointed. And I'm like, "What's wrong with that?" And and they're like, yeah, "I don't see a future." I'm like, and then I start talking about, you know, how the whole idea that that fears that that scares people is because I what I think is because they think that they know the future. Like they know if you play video games right now, you're gonna end up, you know. As a as a as a bum on the street or in prison or whatever, just a loser in life, right? They think they know the future, but how can you possibly know the repercussions of actions right now, you know, and what that's going to lead to in in five, ten, fifteen years, right? Twenty years, we have no idea where that's going to lead to. <laughs> but but anything that's ever successful or any inventor or somebody who's really creative, it's always started out with something that they're passionate about, and they had no idea that it was going to lead to, you know. Did Steve Jobs, could he envision the iPhone back when he was like a teenager? You know, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, but things, it, they, they, they um, build and they lead up to something. And you have, and once, when you're denying your kids doing something that they actually enjoy passionately, you're really destroying their potential. You're destroying their future. And you're, you're supplanting it with a future that you think is best for them, but actually is... It's like you, you, we're teaching them, you know, ancient knowledge <laughs> that is no longer re relevant. But that's what we think is important. But maybe it's not relevant to their lives. Maybe they're never going to need to know, you know, Euclidean ge geometry. <laughs> you know, maybe they're going to they're going to invent a new geometry. You know, so by us by us forcing ancient knowledge on them, we're depriving them of their creativity 
and imagination. So they need to learn it. They'll learn it. And oh, exactly. it, this will probably be the last thing I say in the show for wrapping up. But uh, to quote the great Gary Vaynerchuk, he said, "I don't care if my kids. He's got two kids in school. He said, I don't care if they both fail out of school and get kicked out." He said, to be the smartest person in the room has never been less important in the entire history of humans. He said, for instance, who's the 12th president? I don't know this guy. <laughs> so all this shit you have in your head is pointless when someone can go, oh, 12th president, boom, right here. It's useless trivia. That's all they're pumping, pumping your kids' minds with in, in public school. Useless tidbits of trivia. There's yeah, there's stuff. There's those intangibles, you know. It's like they talk about football players. Oh, he's got intangibles. Well, that means that that's stuff that you can't teach. Leadership, stuff like that. You can't teach someone to be an actor. You can go to acting school all you want, but you can't be Tom Cruise from going to acting school. You can, you can teach. You can go to all the culinary schools you want, but Gord, there's one Gordon Ramsay. You can't learn to be Gordon Ramsay. Yeah. You, etc. This goes on to everything. It's all, you either got it or you don't. And there, all this pointless, mindless bullshit that they want to throw on top of the human experience at the, the prime years. Like, if you think about this logically, if we jump back 100 years, people died around 30, 35. <laughs> if they went to school like it's set up now, they graduated 18, and then for 10 years they get to do what they want with their life. Yep. <laughs> so it's just a little ridiculous. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I, I'm looking forward to homeschooling my kids, unschooling uh, more more, more uh, precisely because uh, that's the route I, I would personally like to go with them. Um, it's I, I just I really want people that that watch this. If you, you know, if you still send your children to public school or if you still think it's a good idea, if you're one of those people that pays into it because you even though you don't have children and you, you think it's, it's helping people, you know, tr try examining the numbers a little bit. You know, I, I know plenty of people who claim to, but then they still come back and say, oh, well, we need these things and we need to pay the teachers. It's like, why? W what has it actually done for you? You know, if, if you're a product of public school, you know, how far do you think you've really gotten? You know, you, you, you have this lifestyle that was almost predetermined for you because that's the way the system was designed. The system was designed to churn out workers. It was de de designed to churn out, you know, the obedient citizens that believe this, this rhetoric that gets tossed around that, you know, with, without, without the government schools, there would be no schools. You know, I, I think I touched on this on another one of our shows about the, uh, the uh, the parent based private schools that are going on in India like you look around the world like people are figuring this stuff out and it, it, you don't need to have your money extorted from you uh, on a regular basis to pay for these relics as as Danilo put it that are that are just keeping your children back they really do you know that was something else he said Danilo that they they stifle creativity well, and. That's, I think, the most damaging thing about public schools is they just they, they suck the life out of children. And, and like I said earlier, the ones that succeed in the public schools come out with this false sense of security, like they have some knowledge and, and they have a, a, a head up on, on their on their classmates because that's what's pumped into them. And, and yes, will it translate later in life? If you're lucky, yeah, you'll 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 get connected because you you, you followed the rules and you played the game. But that's not really living. You know, the, the goal is the goal. The goal in life is to live it. So let your children do that. You know, especially if you were if you were forced into that situation, that that should give you all the more reason to not make your children go down the same path. You know, mm -hmm. people people always talk about, you know, getting that good job and 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 succeeding in life so they can give their children the things they, they didn't have. But they never think of the things that they did have that they shouldn't have <laughs> and public schooling is one of those you know if you can give your if you have the opportunity to give your child the freedom to learn at their own pace you know what they want to learn what they're passionate about mm -hmm. you are giving them a gift that you know few of us were ever even given the opportunity to receive and, and that's just that's something amazing to me and I, I can't wait to be able to do that for my kids and I, I just really hope that other people um, you know follow that lead because that that's 
that's gonna that's the one thing I, I see is leading to a better world is you know letting letting the kids learn on their own and, and letting them gain real knowledge and then turning around and, and looking at the system and saying yeah we don't need you for this anymore what else don't we need you for <laughs> it absolutely starts at home with peaceful parenting and unschooling and I am a firm believer of that um, unlike Stefan Molyneux for example Stefan thinks that, that the uh, you know peaceful parenting is the the end all that's going to bring about the end of the state in 200 years when everybody's become a peaceful parent I don't it, I, I can't say it's the only thing like that but yeah, it is really important, and it is absolutely necessary to uh, to raise free-thinking kids who uh, are not a bunch of mindless robots who can churn out standardized testing. I'm, I'll just um, I'll just mention a couple of uh, logical fallacies. Amazing, we didn't even touch on a logical fallacy <laughs> all episode. But so so it, it, government schools are, in my mind, the appeal to uh, authority, the appeal to antiquity, and the false dilemma. <laughs> right so so appeal to antiquity you know we've always had public school <laughs> how can you not send your kids to public school I went to public school your your grandfather went to public school <laughs> why wouldn't you send your kids to public school that's look at you 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 went to public school you turned out okay <laughs> that's, that's the funny thing is public schools have only been around for a hundred years that's yeah. it a hundred years is not a long time I mean how did people learn how to read in, in the 1700s yeah. or 1800s without Exactly. It down their throat. The answer is they didn't because they didn't need to. They worked on farms. They don't need to learn how to read. They need to learn how to pull tractors and milk cows and shit like that. They don't need yeah. to learn. You mean to, to tell me that William Shakespeare didn't go to public school? You're telling me that right now? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, he didn't. No, he didn't. I'm, I'm letting you know he did. <laughs> so, that, so, so you have the appeal to authority, right? You know, all, all the kids look to the look to the teacher, the authority figure, as the conveyor of truth, right? Conveyor of knowledge, not to yourself, not to your peers, not not like think about the answer. No, the teacher. It's a it's a top down approach, right? And the false dilemma, which would be, um, you know, if we don't have, if we don't have government schools. We, we will be suffering from an epidemic of illiteracy, right? <laughs> we will all be stupid, deaf, dumb, and blind, right? So, <laughs> um, but, but um, yeah, this is a very, very uh, interesting topic that I think a, a lot of people need to consider because I think the, the one thing that I like to think of uh, as peaceful parents and as uh, raising um, unschoolers is that we are breaking the cycle of violence, right? And this is what volunteers basically... Um, um, advocate is that you know if you if you you know this is another thing I ask people you know when I'm talking about unschooling and homeschooling I say did you enjoy your public schooling experience <laughs> okay and if they say no then I'm like well how can you in your right mind and <laughs> with with empathy and compassion send your your little ones to, to, to public school, to an institution that you suffered in and that you did not enjoy and you, you, don't, have, you don't have happy memories from. How can you possibly do that? And does, not, does that not make you a sadist? <laughs> sick, it seems to me to be sick and twisted to do that. It's, like, it, it's kind of like people who say, you know, I'm circumcised, so I've got to circumcise my son. He's got to be exactly like me. You know, I'm, I'm amputated, I've got to amputate my son. I have one eye. <laughs> <laughs> my son, you know, he has to be my carbon copy. It, it pulls know? into the whole "daddy will fix it" scenario. Yeah, daddy being government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That. Yeah, I don't want to raise my kids. I'll let government do it. That's, that's essentially it. what you're saying when you send your kids to public school. Yeah, that's the other thing I say is is uh, you know if you if you give your children over to the state to raise them, don't be disappointed at the results <laughs> because you have no you have no. Uh, control over that anymore. I mean, I mean, I mean, not, not that you're trying to control your kids, but but you are sending them to an institution where actually another thing we should probably mention is that when when the CPS Child Protective Services picks up children, where do you think the place that they go to to interview and to isolate and to get crucial information on the children is in government schools because they are separated from their parents. Right, that is the only place that they go. Is that is the easiest place they can go to to isolate them, and inc and get them to incriminate themselves, right, uh, against their parents. So, so it's really it's really um is is sad and destructive, and uh, I, I would even consider it child abuse to send for for people to send their kids to government schools. Um, so so we really have to uh, we, people have, people should you know learn about history and learn about the history of government schools and um and what is uh 
I was corrupting the youth as we were <laughs> we were talking about earlier. <laughs> that is the true corrupting of the youth right there. <laughs> for sure, for sure. So, so uh, uh, yeah, thank so, you very much, uh, John, for for coming on the show. Yeah, guys, thanks for having me. If if I can take a minute to uh, just plug a few things and uh, get yeah, a yeah, go ahead. Plug away, sir. <laughs> uh, you can find me at uh, the New Sons and Daughters of Liberty. That's uh, <clears throat> my page for anything you want to bitch about the state, anything related to volunteerism, anarchy. That's that's where it's at right there. Um, any questions about unschooling? I I really do believe in unschooling, um, but don't take it from me. Don't don't unschool your kids just because some crazy anti-statist on on the internet told you to do it. Do your own research. <laughs> Read the book. There's books by John Holt. There's there's Facebook groups. There's you know connect with people on Twitter. Do your own research and talk to people and learn as much as you can about unschooling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Very Educate true. yourselves, people. In the age in the age of information, ignorance is a choice. Remember that, everybody. <laughs> yep. There's no, excuse, no excuses you anymore. You can talk to me at un about unschooling over at the Raising Common Sense Anarchist. Uh, we have about seven, seven, eight, nine—I don't remember how many—seven, eight, or nine admins, and they're all fantastic. And they all—they um, all range in expertise from new unschoolers to experienced unschoolers. And uh, we can absolutely answer any question that you might have about unschooling. Awesome, excellent well, resource. Well, thank you, John, for coming on. I love you, brother. Yeah. I yeah. hope, uh, I hope uh, for. Um, we can have you on in a future episode to maybe talk about something else. Maybe if, you know, if, if you feel passionate about coming on and talking about something, I'm, I'm sure we'd love to have you again. Yeah, sure. sure. Hit me up on Facebook. Definitely. Awesome. All right, so that's, uh, that wraps it up for another episode of the Seeds of Liberty podcast, episode nine. Thank you very much for listening, and have a well, wonderful day. I, I, we got to get something out of Jeremy. He hasn't talked in like 20 minutes. Come on, say, say something before we end the show. My hot tip to the Freedom Fans tonight, worms. <laughs> Worms? All right. <laughs> I still don't get it, but okay. <laughs> do, do you get the relevance of that? No, no. <laughs> Thanks, everyone, for watching <laughs> or listening. There, there, <laughs> there, is, there is a relevance. It's, it's a takeoff on, on the old school, like in the 80s, 90s, when people used to say word. Uh, so they, uh, they change it to worms instead to make it more their style, and it's, uh, it's something they do. <laughs> nice. All right, we learned a little bit of trivia. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Take care. Peace. Bye. Bye.